despite my best efforts, is a surface reading. Like I read it, but I'm reading it and I'm trying to get the message that God wants me to get. But because I'm reading it for my own edification, it only goes so deep despite my best efforts. But any of you who teach, and I'm talking about not just in a classroom, but when you're teaching in your um, business, because all of you, if you work in a business or work in a company or you're trying to teach somebody that works for you, you realize if you have to teach somebody else something, you've got to go on a whole nother level because you have to understand what it is you're talking about in a bigger sense to be able to show somebody else something. So when you're writing a sermon, you've got to understand it a whole lot more richly. So and so when you ask me uh, to come and preach, then when I'm reading about the particular verse, I've got to know it a lot better, and it forces me to understand it better. And in that way, I'm getting a huge blessing. And so I want to thank you for that because every time I'm the one who ends up with a huge blessing, and that is exactly what I've heard this week as well. The scripture today is John 129, and it was quoting John the Baptist, and I did the King James Version for this verse um, so that it would come out in a particular way. Uh, so it says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And although that is just one verse, it is a very big mouthful of meaning in that verse. And we're going to talk today about why. Because the sermon today is, Behold the Lamb of God. So you've probably already talked about this maybe last week with your pastor about when is Passover 2024. Passover actually began before sundown on Monday, uh, sundown on Monday April 22nd. And will end after nightfall this Tuesday, coming up on April the 30th in the United States. So even though we have already technically celebrated Resurrection Sunday, and that was just a while back, we are just now in the week of Passover. So how is that possible? And, you know, I looked into that, like, how is that possible? Because it would seem like one would follow the other. And I won't get into all the details. I wouldn't say I wouldn't bore you with the details because I actually find them quite interesting. But the Jewish calendar follows the moon. The Christian calendar follows the sun. And I think Easter should always follow Passover because, after all, isn't that where Jesus was <laughs> when this all occurred? But if the Christians are going to church on Sunday, and they want Easter to follow on a Sunday, they have to follow a certain calendar to get Easter to always follow on Sunday. And therefore, this year, it just worked out in such a way that when Easter came, it came on that particular Sunday where the Jewish Passover came the week that we're in right now. So mathematically, that's how it works out from time to time. But what I want to bring to mind today is the full circle that God created from the imagery of Jesus in the manger. So if you were here that Sunday, we're talking two years ago, but you may recall, um, and also my mom will, because I did it at, at Cameron Methodist as well, that God did a lot of the imagery for the priest um, as well when Jesus was born. If you remember me talking about when Jesus was born and he was in the manger and he was swaddled in the cloth there, this was not just... A pretty little picture for us to see in a in a scene 2,000 years later. The priest should have, and I say priest, the, the actual shepherds that were in the field that day were not just common shepherds. These were actual men who prepared lambs uh, to be born and to not have blemish and to be uh, lambs that were going to be sacrificed later on. They understood how to look for lambs that didn't have blemishes to get these lambs to the temple priest. They understood about getting them there to lay them on a, a thing that looked like a stone trough and to have them bound so that they wouldn't squirm. They, they understood or should have that when they saw Jesus in the same position laying on this stone manger that he should have looked very similar to these young lambs that were being offered to the priests for sacrifice. So God was very careful with the imagery when Jesus was born to make him look the exact same way. And so... God didn't stop there. We're going to see that today when he got all the way to when Jesus was sacrificed, that he continued with the imagery as well. And so if anybody had eyes to see, 
especially like when Jesus was born, they would have had eyes to see imagery as well when he was sacrificed. Um, I was very deeply touched when I did the research, and I hope that you will be as well. It's, um, it's very lovely and sweet when it's a new baby being born, but it's quite uh, an upsetting yet precious thing when it's on the other end of a sacrifice. Um, so let's start out with the books of the Bible that the Jewish people and we Christians share, and that's the Torah, those first five books of our Bible. We call it the Old Testament, and they call it the Torah. So let's begin there. Uh, let's just keep in mind how holy the Jewish people consider, consider the Old Testament, the Torah. Uh, they consider it God's divine revelation to his people, and so do we. It is his very word to them and to us. In ancient times, as now, the Torah was read aloud in the synagogues. It, it was then, as it is now, discussed. They debate it. They study it thoroughly as the learned men of God. This is not something they just do once a week. They talk about it all the time. You know, when they get together, they argue about it. They discuss it in detail. It's, they're passionate about it. In traditional Jewish education, boys by the age of six would be expected to attend synagogue schools. By the age of 10 years old, they will have learned and memorized those first five books. So by the time you're 10 years old, a Jewish boy should know the entire Old Testament by memory without even having to have the papers there with them. So every Jewish man past the age of 10 years old should readily recognize the events and symbolism related to the Torah if he sees them in real life, if he is inclined and open to do so. So there would be, unlike us, who have um, a passing uh, memory of what goes on in the Bible and recognition of what goes on in the Bible, Jewish uh, boys up until the age, from age 10 on should recognize it in real life if they see it because it's ingrained in their memories. In the Torah in Exodus 12, and I'm paraphrasing so that we have, can get in a condensed period, period of time, we read, as the Jewish people in Jesus' day read, this was when God, by the way, was bringing the 10 plagues on Egypt in order to free his people from bondage. And that's physical bondage, which God was using as a symbol as from our bondage uh, from sin and death. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron and said, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, which is the time that we are in right now. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast it with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. This is the Lord's Passover, which is where we are right now. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, little g, of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you and destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So this is the first time he's done that. And he's laying out, this is what I do to free my people from the bondage and to get them free. Well, the people of God did cover their doorposts with the blood of the sacrificed lambs. And when they did so, God spared their very lives. And God realizes that humans have a very short memory. So he continued that symbolism one more time. In Joshua 2, we read about a Canaanite woman living in Jericho, and depending on how you pronounce it, it's either Rahab or Rahab. Most people say Rahab, so we're going to go with that. She was a prostitute, but she's also a biblical heroine. According to the narrative, before the conquest of Canaan, Joshua sent two men as spies to see the land. They came to Rahab's house for lodging and for information. When the king's men sought them out at her home, she hid them, and she helped them to escape. 
She told these men that she believed the God of Israel was powerful and that his people were going to be able to conquer the land because of their God. The spies told her that if she left a scarlet, which is a red rope, in her window and brought her family into the home, that anyone marked the anyone inside that home marked with that red rope was going to be spared when the Israelites came to conquer Canaan. That scarlet rope on the window was a symbol of the Lamb's blood over a group of people who were professing trust in the God of Israel. And because they did that, their lives were spared. So God gave another symbol of the red over the door or red over the window and you profess trust in God and your life will be spared. Well, in Egypt, God had orchestrated this major event, the freeing of his people from bondage, the protecting them from his wrath, the judgment of death with the blood of a sacrificed lamb. He did this to, to uh, begin a process that they were supposed to reenact yearly to cement the idea in their hearts and in their minds so that when the real lamb which was Jesus, was sacrificed for their ultimate release from bondage and their forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life free from a soul death was given, that they would recognize that. Yet most did not, and they have not yet. Following the release from Egypt, God trained the Levitical priests to continue the sacrifice of lambs for his people to help them to comprehend the reality of the wages of sin being death. The sacrifice of sheep were offerings to God to atone for sin and to have fellowship with and to be at peace with God. And this was done year after year for hundreds of years. So he was letting them reenact it. And again, if you're somebody who teaches other people, you know that telling somebody something only goes so far. But having them to stand up and enact it and reenact it usually does reinforce understanding. So God, the ultimate teacher, had them up working with this and reenacting it to get this hammer home. Carefully and with great effort and forethought, the Lord laid out the actions of a sacrificial lamb being offered up instead of the lives of his people to pay for the sins of his people. Year after year, the Israelites followed God's instruction. They discussed every detail. They fine-tuned each aspect with discussions and study. They documented their methods to adhere to God's law in special books. And we're going to talk about just two of those books today. The um, Jewish people have several books that they keep and have kept for hundreds of years that are very detailed and very well thought out that go along with the Torah so that they don't make any mistakes because they go by the law. But we're only going to talk briefly about two. One of them is the, and I'm going to probably pronounce it wrong because I'm not Jewish, but doing the best I can. One's the Mishnah. This is the first and great rabbi's book. It was compiled about 200 years before Jesus was born. It documents the legal opinions, and we're talking about God's law, with regard, regard to God's <clears throat> commands. And for people relying on God's law and not God's grace, this is incredibly important to them because they don't they can't rely on the grace of Jesus because they haven't accepted the grace. So they have to rely on the law that God has laid out. Every man, woman, and older Jewish child would be very aware of its contents to the very smallest detail. And we're going to talk about the Talmud. This is the record of generations of rabbis debates on the things that God, of God in Judaism, it was compiled between 400 and 500 years before Jesus' birth. In it, there's a section called the, I'm going to probably butcher this too, but the Pesachim, that means the Passover festivals. So they've been talking about how to do Passover, how to get it precisely correct for about four or 500 years before Jesus even came there. And they've talked about it year after year after year after year to get it perfectly right. Now, recall that when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. This is the same John the Baptist whose tiny unborn body leapt within his mother's womb when he heard Jesus' mother 
Mary's voice when she was carrying Jesus. His spirit, even before birth, knew the significance of Jesus' arrival and mission. So when he calls Jesus the Lamb of God, the one to take away the sins of the world, he set a mouthful. In Exodus 12, when God is giving Moses and Aaron instructions to provide to the Jewish people for the sacrifice of lambs on the night of the angel of death is to go throughout the land of Egypt to slay the firstborn, God states that from that point forward, each year a man is to sacrifice a lamb for his family for the newly God-created feast of Passover. So, by the time John makes this statement about Jesus, hundreds of years have occurred with the Jewish men bringing lambs for the Passover sacrifice. John is stating that this is the lamb that God is bringing. Jesus is the lamb that God is bringing. Jewish men bring lambs to atone for their sins and for the sins of their families. John says Jesus is the one to take away the sins of the world. God is providing a lamb to atone for the sins of the world. One verse, but an incredibly powerful verse is stated. Several times in the scriptures, God says that the Israelites are a stiff-necked people, meaning they're stubborn. doesn't mean he doesn't love them. It means I've shown them over and over again, and they just won't see. Truly, it would seem the case here. Again, we recall that Hebrew men, they know the Torah. They know the traditional Jewish books like the Mishnah. They know it very well. Their wives are even instructed in it at home, so nobody is escaping the instruction. Their children, they know it well, especially the boys. Their home and community lives revolve around their faith and the rituals from the time they wake up until they go to bed. Yet the fact that Jesus was and is the Lamb of God did escape their notice, and it is mind-blowing, but we're guilty of escaping things that are within our notice as well. It is awesome, and it is haunting, too, to think about the reality of what was going on that week and how it did not dawn on more of them. In the Pesachim, which is the Passover festivals, which is in the Talmud, we learn that the Passover lamb must be examined for four days prior to its slaughter. That was one of the things that everybody knew. They also knew there was no other offering that requires a four-day examination. So there's something special about having to examine it for at least four days prior. Here's what the learned men of Israel, the elders, would not only know this, but they would have spent the week they were actually in that week examining lambs for the Passover sacrifice. So the week Jesus was there and they were interacting with him, they were also at the same time examining lambs every day for the Passover sacrifice. We read in Exodus 12 that your lamb shall be without blemish. That's what they're looking for. They're examining lambs to make sure the lambs have no faults, have no blemish. So Jesus is examined, we read, that whole week to see if he has faults and blemishes. They just don't realize that's what they're doing. In Matthew, we read about that week, we read that Jesus came to Jerusalem for the Passover and while he is there, he is examined. He's questioned. In chapter 21, Jesus entered the, entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him, and they did question him. In Matthew 22, the Pharisees questioned him, and we are told they were amazed by his wise response. The Sadducees also questioned him in front of a crowd. The people were astonished, we are told, at his teaching. The Pharisees even had their expert in the law to come back and try again. And his answers were so masterful that we are told that no one could reply to him. And then no one dared to question him further. They couldn't find fault in him. Luke 23 the, said, Pilate called together the chief priests again, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. Pilate said, I have examined him in your presence, and I have found no basis for your charges against him. 
again, could find no blemish, could find no fault. John 18, we read, What is the truth, retorted Pilate? With this he went out to the Jews, gathered there, and he said, I find no basis for a charge against him. He's letting them know this man has no fault. Matthew 26, Jesus went before the Sanhedrin, that is the legislative and judicial assembly of the rabbi elders. These men knew the Torah, and they were the experts in all the Jewish books. And I'm paraphrasing. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, the highest of all the experts, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence, looking for flaws, looking for blemishes against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any though many false witnesses came forward. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that they are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent as a lamb. But then the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more of this witness? Look now, you have heard blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. In other words, Jesus was found in his four days of examination to be free of blemish and worthy of sacrifice. They were too stiff-necked to see that the actual priests to examine the lambs to see if they have any blemishes and whether or not they're worthy of sacrifice had actually done that. They had actually done that. He was exactly like the Passover lamb. In the Mishnah, the rest of the Passover lamb ritual was laid out, and it was followed. As you will see in Jesus' sacrifice as the lamb of God, just as John said, the Mishnah tells us, that any money left over from the purchase of a Passover lamb cannot be used for the purchase of another Passover lamb. So people didn't, it was very hard to have a um, blemish-free lamb. That's why they had to be raised out in the area where Jesus was actually born, and they had to be taken very good care of, and the priest had to examine them. In order to get one of those blemish-free lambs, you had to wait and purchase one. I want you also to recall that Judas took 30 pieces of silver from the priest in exchange for handing over Jesus, the blemish-free lamb. They purchased the blemish-free lamb from him. In Matthew 27, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood, not guilty blood, what is that to us, they replied. That is your responsibility. Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury, since it is blood money. They decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. So even in this relatively small detail, the money used to purchase the Passover lamb could not be put back into the treasury to be at risk for being reused for the purchase of another Passover lamb in the future. It had to be spent on something completely different. They had acted on their own Mishnah tradition without even recognizing they had done it. The timing also was mind-blowingly accurate for the sacrifice of God's Passover lamb in Jesus' case. Traditional Judaism defines a special Sabbath as one that precedes or coincides with a Jewish holiday during the calendar year. And in John 19, we are told now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. So we do know that this particular Passover Eve, when Jesus was there being crucified, actually did occur on a Friday, although there's been debate, debate there's proof here that, that it did occur on a Friday. Jesus did go to the cross on a Friday. This Friday was already considered preparation day because Jews prepare on a Friday because they cannot do anything 
with effort on Saturday, their Sabbath. This was an especially busy preparation day because they had to prepare not only for their day of rest, but one on which special foods, that's the Passover meal, was going to be present. The Mishnah also discusses the exact timing of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. On the eve of Passover, on that Friday, uh, that occurs on the eve of Shabbat, so that special Friday we're talking about, the Passover lamb is sacrificed on or after midday. It can begin after 2, with the sacrifice being complete by 3 p.m. This was what was in the Mishnah hundreds of years before Jesus was even born. Matthew 27 tells us from noon, it's even haunting to even say it, from noon until 3 in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About 3 in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a, in a loud voice, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was when he died. It was finished, and the ultimate sacrifice had been made. Luke 23 says it was now about noon. Darkness came over the whole land until 3 in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining. The Lord Jesus, the actual true Passover lamb, the one that God himself brought for that Passover to atone for the sins of his house, which was the whole world, had been sacrificed alongside all the other lambs of his people at the exact time. And thinking about that actually happened gives me chills because that actually happened. God brought his lamb and his lamb was sacrificed at the exact minute everybody else in Israel was sacrificing their Passover lamb. The next part, though, the imagery is going to be difficult. But death is difficult and it is ugly. And that is why God has to act in such a huge way over the course of thousands of years through millions of people to make us understand and to get us to desperately despise death and to crave eternal life. Because in reality, in the temple at that moment of Jesus' sacrifice, just as it had been for hundreds of years, the Mishnah tells us that the sacrificial lambs would be suspended on iron hooks that were secured in the walls and pillars of the temple to complete that sacrifice. And if you went in and too many people were already using the hooks and a place could not be found, thin, smooth rods were provided and the offered lamb would be suspended between two men's shoulders. Do you remember Jesus being there and two men being on either side? For the final sacrificial act. The final sacrificial act. Now remember, they are eating the lamb, so you have to take all its pelt. If you hunt... You know that this is usually accomplished with the animal upside down. So I didn't want to just assume anything, so I looked into why the Passover lamb has to be upright to be to have the pelt removed. It has to do really with two important symbols to the Jews. One being the fact that the ram that was given by God was caught in a thicket by his, thorn, his horns. And it is depicted in Jewish art as being suspended in a tree with his feet off the ground. You know, remember when God gave the lamb and said uh, to Abraham, do not offer up Isaac, I'm providing you the ram. Do you remember that? The ram was actually caught in a thicket. And when you see art, if you look it up now, the, the ram that was offered, he's up off the ground with his head caught up. And when you see that art, so that's one of the reasons when they sacrifice the lambs, they have him upright, not upside down. Also, number two, David's son Absalom was killed when his long hair was caught in a tree suspending him off the ground between heaven and earth. So they do not offer up the lamb upside down. They offer him up this way. Guys, I don't mean to make it even more horrifying, but to peel him, they do this. So that lamb is suspended between two rods like this to be peeled. They did not realize that Jesus was right outside the door the same exact way at the same exact time, hanging the same exact way. And one thing I didn't realize, and I had to go back and look it up last night, because I saw it mentioned briefly, and I said, I want to know more about that. All of their artwork has the ram with his head in the thicket. 
All other artwork has Absalom with his hair caught in branches. And one of the rabbis said, and that could be why Jesus had the crown of thorns. Because God did not miss any detail when he offered. He said, I provided you a lamb. He still did the same thing as I've got him caught by the thorns. Every single detail. God provided his lamb. The Exodus Passover lamb, its blood was sprinkled on the doorpost with a bundle of hyssop. Do you remember in, in Exodus, he says he had to put it on with hyssop. God misses no detail. In John 19, we read later, knowing that everything had now been finished, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. They soaked the sponge in it. They put it on a sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant means nothing to us, but to the elders who know and have read about the hyssop plant over and over and over, they, somebody should have said, whoa, it should have shocked one of them. He lifted it to Jesus' lips. It seems that somebody would have recognized, and that perhaps they did. I'm not saying that they did, but perhaps they recognized that um, coincidence. In the Exodus, the Lamb's blood was to show the angel of death to pass over the people of God. But God continued, as we've stated, to have the Hebrews reenact the sacrifice of lambs to shed the blood to atone for sin. When Pilate saw that he had been getting nowhere and that instead there was an uproar that was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd and he said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Now keep in mind in Exodus, God had said, when I see the blood, it, I will pass over your families and I will spare you from death. So when Pilate said, I am innocent of this man's blood, all the people answered and said, his blood is on <clears throat> us and on our children. And little did they understand that was actually a literal meaning. John 19 says, instead of one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. So here we have the actual blood, the actual atoning blood being shed over them and their children and praise God on us as well. Matthew 26, we read when Jesus actually told them ahead of time this was going to happen. Then with a cup, it said he had given thanks and he said to them, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In Exodus, the blood of the Lamb was offered by man uh, to God, was honored by God, and saved him from physical death. Now, at this time of crucifixion, the blood of the Lamb offered to man by God is honored by God to save the world from an eternal soul death. In the Mishnah we read, we are reminded that no bone can be broken. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and they did break the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then of the other. But when they came to break Jesus' bones, they found that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. Because broken bones in the Passover lamb would make the sacrifice invalid. How did this additional detail not strike fear in the hearts of the learned men of Israel? I cannot take credit for this last part I'm going to read as it comes from a website called RabbiYeshua.com but it puts all of this in such a moving way that I could not say it better. And they say it this way. It's Passover Eve. The biblical day begins at sunset. If we follow John's chronology, Yeshua and his disciples were settling into the upper room for his last cedar as the Jerusalem sunset marked the beginning of the 14th day of the first month. In Exodus 12, the Israelites were commanded to kill the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the first month. That meant that the following afternoon, the Passover lambs were to be slaughtered in the temple. This being so, Yeshua's celebration of the cedar is a day early. He hosts his last cedar a day early so that he and his disciples can have one last cedar together. When the proper time for the cedar arrives the following evening, Yeshua will already be buried. 
at the time of slaughter. A short time later, Yeshua is hung on the cross. It is the third hour, 9 a.m. by our reckoning when he is crucified. On that day in the temple was crowded with pilgrims bringing up their lambs for the Passover slaughter. All the priesthood of Israel was also at the temple for this festival. Because of the great number of lambs to be slaughtered the afternoon, it was continually offering lambs to be performed very early. The Mishnah reports to us that the daily burnt offering was slaughtered at the 8th hour, about 2.30, and offered up until the ninth hour, about 3.30. But on the eve of Passover, it was slaughtered at the 7th hour and a half and offered up at the 8th hour and a half. Thus, the slaughter of the Passover lamb was performed during the ninth hour. This is Jewish timing. The lambs were killed and their blood applied to the altar in an old-fashioned fire line style. Lines of priests stood ready with gold and silver basins for passing the blood to the altar. Again, we turn to the Mishnah for details. An Israelite slaughters the Passover lamb, and a priest received the blood, hands it to his fellow, and his fellow to his fellow, each one receiving a full basin and handing back an empty one. The priest nearest the altar tosses the blood in a single act. The Passover lambs were killed in three consecutive ways. When the slaughter was being performed, the Levites in the temple chanted Psalm 113-118, the same Hallel which Yeshua and his disciples would have sung the night before, the death of the Lamb. When the night hour arrived, a long blast of the shofar signaled the Levites that would begin their chanting of the Hallel. When the gates to the inner court were open and the first crowd of Israelites and their lambs were ready to rush in, Within minutes, the clean and spotless courtyard around the altar was stained red with blood. The gutters would flow with blood. The base of the altar seemed to bleed itself and even gush forth as basin after basin of blood was splashed against it in quick succession. The dead lambs were hung on hooks, forearms spread in crucifixion pose as they were skinned and prepared for roasting. The Levites would continue chanting the Hallel. The sound of their voices joined by the voices of thousands of pilgrims who had gathered at the temple. This filled the entire city of Jerusalem. Indeed, you could hear them outside the walls, a short distance away where Yeshua himself had been hanging on the cross for six hours. As they chanted these words, and you could hear them, the cords of death entangle me. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his righteous one. Open for me the gates of righteousness. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. And then Yeshua died. It was the ninth hour, the very hour the Passover lambs were being slain and dying in the temple. And Yeshua, the lamb with a capital L, died. This is the story of Exodus, the Passover lamb of Egypt. Paul tells us that the Messiah, our Passover lamb, had been sacrificed. It is by his blood applied to the doorpost of our lives that we are spared the fate of the Egyptian firstborn. By Jesus' blood applied to our lives, the last judgment passes over us. And all of this comes down to two things, and these are my words. Don't be stiff-necked. When God is doing things for you, recognize it. They didn't. We need to be able to recognize it. Don't get caught up in doing what you think as a human is the right thing to do. Open your eyes to see what he is doing, and you might just find out that he is offering you something better than what your own efforts are accomplishing, because they were working as hard as they could. But what Jesus was doing out right outside the walls was far greater. And number two, don't be stiff-necked. God provided the lamb. It's Jesus. And he is the only one that can take away your sins. All you have to do is accept Jesus' blood of your life, repent of your sins, and consider yourself as belonging to Jesus. Let us pray. Jesus, uh, we are so in awe of what went on that day and, and realize that you and God together, and the Holy Spirit, what you accomplished over thousands of years in such minute detail to get this done is just mind-blowing and we are just as hard-headed hard and stiff-necked as the Jews were that day not seeing what is right before our eyes but Lord uh, you will show it to us if we will seek it out and 
we are incredibly grateful. It's, it's, you do for us what we do for our own children. You do anything to save us, to get us to be with you, and to have eternal life with you. And Lord, there's, there's nothing we can do to thank you enough. And it is shocking when we realize what you had to go through, but we are incredibly grateful. Lord, let us always be mindful of the sacrifice you made and always live a life full of gratitude for that. We ask this in Jesus' most precious holy name. Amen.